Today on Locked On Red Wings, Detroit loses 5-1, to one, but despite that blowout scoreboard, they actually played really well at even strength in this game. You're Locked On Red Wings, your daily podcast on the Detroit Red Wings. Part of the Locked On Podcast Network, your team every day. Welcome back to the Lockdown Red Wings podcast. We are your hosts, Brian Fisher and Scotty Bentley. I am a podcast producer for the Daily JAWWJ News Radio podcast. Well, Scotty is a freelance journalist for the Detroit News as well as the host of Lockdown Tigers. And today's episode is brought to you by Bet Online. Bet Online has you covered this season with more props, odds, and lines than ever before. Bet Online, where the game starts. Um, yes, and the Red Wings lost five to one to the New Jersey Devils. Uh, not what you would call ideal Scotty by any stretch of the imagination. And, uh, we'll talk about that and how that is not necessarily, well, like losing five to one is bad. No matter any way you slice it, they actually played really well in this game. I thought, and it, it was a matter of special teams and not capitalizing on your chances is what made the difference in this game. But before we can even get to that, we have to mention the fact that Jacob Vrana did in fact clear waivers. Um, they asked Derek, Derek Lalonde about it during the post practice media availability. Of course, he didn't really say much. He just said that a roster decision had to be made. And this is the decision they came to. He and Eiserman came to, and he says, like, I won't get into the specifics because of like the situation starting Grana. But so we still don't know the reason why he was the cho- the player chosen to be waived, but he did clear and he got assigned to Grand Rapids and was then uh, Robbie Fabry was then officially activated. And then Alex Nadelkovich was assigned to Grand Rapids on a conditioning stint. So a lot of like official things happened today. <laughs> yeah. Well, I, I think like maybe answer your own question there. Like we don't really know why I think we do because it worked. I, <laughs> I think like, obviously, you know, every, the, the outside, you know, the, everybody's going to have a theory on, you know, the, the outside, things that are going on with Verona and the off the ice stuff that's been going on with him this year. And everybody's going to have their own theory and whatnot. But at the end of the day, he picked someone that cleared waivers and that's pretty much all that matters from a hockey sense. So if you look at the factual, the facts that literally took place and happened, I think what we said last night is probably what's closest to the truth. I feel like people are trying to make it out to be bigger than it really is. And I think it was literally what we said last night is that Jacob Verona is not NHL ready. He makes $5.2 million a year this year and next year and is it's unpredictable on where he could be and how soon he could be there. So no team wanted to take a risk on a guy who, despite being having an incredibly high ceiling, you have no idea what you're going to get in him at this moment. So I think that it was literally just came down to logic. I don't think there was anything else to it at this point is that, He wasn't NHL ready, and for the salary he was getting paid, no team wanted to take that contract down at the moment. You know, if this was Jacob, if this is Jacob Verona post injury last season, where he scored like what was it, 10, 12, what, eight, seven, 16, 17 points in like 20 games? Yeah, yeah, point a game for for a while there. Yeah, but that's not Jacob Verona right now. So I I think in the end, it made perfect sense. Nadelkovich. We got signed down to uh, Grand Rapids on a conditioning stint so he can have up to two weeks there. And he made the start tonight as of recording this against the Cleveland Monsters, got the three to one win and was named the number one star in the game and made 26 saves and 27 shots. So fantastic news on the Alex Nadelkovich front as that was his first start in a hockey game since December 8th, I believe. Jeez. So just Alex Nadelkovich needed that on so many levels. So even at the AHL level for him to go out there and just put up a stellar performance, get the win, get the number one star. I mean, hopefully that'll get the ball rolling towards getting his confidence back up and getting him back into, I'm not even saying like one, a one B I'm just, if he can get back to the backup role and be a solid backup, that's that, that'd make me more than happy. Absolutely. Also the, the, USA versus Canada game was during this as well. And they had live cut-ins during, uh, well, the entire game, I guess. And very controversial couple, pretty controversial calls in that one. So anyway, let's, let's get into the wings though. Well, you can't, you can't just, 
go say that. Oh, and it was me not a to horrible, respond. Goalie, horrible goalie interference call. Like that's really all there the, is. The still. first one was horse crap. Yeah, uh, that wasn't goalie interference whatsoever. The Agreed. second one, textbook letter to the law. Yeah. look at the rule book. That was goalie Agreed. interference. It's just when it's coupled with the fact that they already had a goal called off. It's just kind of like builds that narrative that like IIHF loves Canada, um, and it well, did take place in Alpha. I'm not disagreeing. <laughs> I'm not disagreeing. <laughs> I'm just saying. We gotta be careful. There's there. a lot of there's a lot of uh, of Canadian Wings fans, and they'll tell us to cope. It's fine. It, it is what it is. <laughs> I mean, like right. the USA lost at the You're end right. of the day. So the there's not much we can You're say. Right. You're right. They they still get the win. Like they can say whatever they want. They <laughs> They're going the to dumb. the gold medal game to play Czech. Although I'm pretty sure that Czech Republic kicked their butts in the first game of the preliminaries. But well, you know, we'll, well, we'll, who are you talking smack for? I'm rooting for anybody but Canada. You know oh, this right. I forgot already. you made that clear. Yeah. I forgot so that that was. A, I, I forgot I you might as well buy a Czech and, uh... Republic flag and hang it back here <laughs> just for tomorrow's recording. Like, That's messed up. Which by the time people hear that, I think they'll already know the outcome. But, right, yeah. Uh, anyways, now we can get to the Red Wings game. Now that I've had my turn to talk, we can. We can yeah, talk. there you go. Uh, that's all that really matters. Uh, sure. Red Wings <laughs> loss to the New Jersey Devils, 5-1. to one. Uh, and Scotty, I mean, I gotta be honest with you. Obviously some crucial things went wrong is which would led to this blowout loss. And I'll I'll call it a blowout loss. I mean, five goals it against is, is a yeah. blowout. The Red Wings played really good in this game at even strength against a team. That's really good at even strength. In fact, they didn't even play good against this team in even strength. They dominated the devils at even strength. They had a 58% share of the shot attempts and a 60% share of the quality shot attempts in this game. Not to mention they actually just straight up flat out outshot the new Jersey, New Jersey devils 33 to 26. Now that gap got closed a lot in the third period, but even in the third, the Red Wings had a plethora of scoring chances. And I think that comes down to, and I think that it, it right there explains the downfall of the Red Wings. One was special teams, obvious, and the other one was not capitalizing on your scoring chances. I mean, you look at the goals that they scored at even strength. Alexander Holtz breaking across the blue line with a ton of space, rips a shot. Jack Hughes with way too much time in front of Billy Huso and a little bit of puck luck on top of it to go off of, I think, Olimata, who's trying to make the save. I mean, it came down to, while the Red Wings outplayed the New Jersey Devils, the New Jersey Devils made the most of their opportunities. Yeah, this was this was definitely a really weird game, and I I think that special teams I think was the the glaring thing that uh, they got outplayed in and had a lot of I mean I don't want to say the sole reason but definitely in in my eyes the biggest reason was just the the poor special teams play but and we highlighted that going into the game like this Devils team is is pretty solid five on five like really good five on five but. Ha, does not have a very good power play and they were good on the power play and you let them into it. Like you can't, you can't afford to do that. But uh, I also thought that this game as a whole was just very, um, I don't even know what the right like word or phrase is. It, it was just, it, it was like a pendulum and it would like swing back. And there was every, one team had all the momentum for like five minutes. And then the other team had all the momentum yes. for like two or three minutes. And then it was like, it, it was, it was not actually, even play for 60 it was just like 20 different <laughs> intervals of like dominant and dominant by the other team You're and they would just it. like take turns dominating their opponent and the wings had more of those moments but the devils put the puck in the back of the net of theirs and and we didn't and and so that's kind of how i view this game it, it wasn't like the wings were just straight up the better team for 60 but they were the better team for a majority of 60 and it, they just failed to take advantage and really got outplayed in the few moments that, that they weren't the better team. In. Your pendulum comment is so spot on. Cause I remember at, with about five minutes left in the first period, I was like already trying to think of like what my period synopsis tweet would look like. And I always have this trend where I like, I always do a period synopsis street tweet for like the first, maybe second, but by the end of the game, I'm like, Oh, whatever. Uh, <laughs> I'm like always just trail off. But for with five minutes left in the first period, I was like, my period synopsis tweet's going to be, it was a back, it was super back and forth first period. Both teams with a lot of fast-paced opportunities. 
And then near the second half of the first, it began to tilt New Jersey Devils. That yeah. was going to be my tweet until the last five minutes of the first period. The Red Wings turned it on and then dominated the Devils and took a right. huge edge. The first period, there. I think, was the most dramatic example of what yeah. I'm describing for sure. Yeah, absolutely. I mean, it was exactly like that the entire game. The only difference is, is when the Devils had their moments of domination, they were able to score and the Red Wings weren't. And that, that and the special teams, which I want to come back to in segment two, is the biggest reasons why the Red Wings lost this game. For sure. Um, but before I can get to that, I got to talk to you guys today about who other than Bet Online. BetOnline.net is your number one source for sports betting info, stats, news, and analysis. Get the latest odds and trends for every professional and amateur league out there. From pro football to college bowl season to basketball and the World Junior Championships, Czech Republic versus Team Canada in the gold medal game. You're going to get Sweden versus Team USA in the bronze. They got it all at betonline.net. If you love sports podcasts, you can find those at BetOnline as well. They've got the fastest and easiest way to get your betting info. Head to the website today or use your mobile device to learn more. BetOnline, where the game starts. Segment two, Lockdown Red Wings podcast. Uh, yes, Scotty, you mentioned it earlier, the fact that the Red Wings on the first two penalty kills of the game immediately allowed goals without a doubt, sank them in this game. I, and then you will go into the third period. You're down by two. That's a very, um, that's, that's a very easy, not easy that two goal lead is with the worst one in hockey is what they always say is what I'm trying to say is it's a very possible lead to overcome deficit to overcome. And they couldn't do it. New Jersey scored immediately, but let me back up a little bit and get back to those penalties that happened before I get too ahead of myself as I'm bouncing all over the place here. <laughs> this is um, a crazy start to a segment, yeah. <laughs> the Those two penalties that occurred against the Detroit Red Wings, and I'm not going to try and sit here and make a case saying that the referees were responsible for the Red Wings' losses. That, the, But those two first penalties were absolute 100% embellishment to the point where on the second penalty, I felt like I was getting gaslighted into what a trip was. <laughs> that second penalty on Jake Wallman, where even the broadcasters were like, ah, I don't know about that one. And the first one on Ben Sherratt, they happen, and I'm watching the replay, and I'm like, is this replay deceiving me to where like I'm misjudging how much force it takes to like trip a guy up? And then I think back to my game against uh, – just two days ago, by the time people are listening to this in men's league, where a guy got around me and I straight up hooked his leg and pulled as hard as I could and he didn't budge. So I'm like, <laughs> no, it's not, I'm not Am wrong. I it's super the, weak. <laughs> like, <laughs> it's not me that's wrong. It's the children that are wrong. Right, like, yeah. <laughs> Old man yells at cloud, right? It, it was it was so ridiculous that those weren't called for embellishments because they were so clearly weak tripping calls in the first place. In fact, when Ben Sherrod initially got the penalty, I was going to be like, Ben Sherrod's been taking a lot more than he's been giving these days. And I watched the replay. I'm like, nah, I'm with Ben Sherrod. That was weak. Yeah. That was a weak trip. And they allowed it on back-to-back -back calls. And the Red Wings couldn't buy a call. I mean, later in the game, Joe Valeno was just trying to follow up on a dump-in, and he was held up for a solid five seconds Hell yeah. interfered with, so he couldn't get to the corner. And then they came back down the ice and scored immediately after that. And I'm like, that was a blatant interference call. But unfortunately, those are the calls that the refs made. And that's the game that we are playing. And night-to-night -night basis, you can't determine how the refs are going to call it. At the end of the day, you still got to kill off those penalties. And losing a defensive draw immediately, and then not covering Dougie Hamilton, giving him a clear shot to the net... That's going to be a goal nine times out of 10 because Dougie Hamilton is one of the best defensemen in the game and he's going to do that. And then on the next penalty kill, sure, uh, on the official initial draw, you cleared it down the ice and then it comes back down for another draw. You lose that draw. They cycle the puck back to Dougie Hamilton, wide open again, who rips another one for a redirected shot off Nico Hishier, I think, this time. I mean, at one time, okay, that'll happen. You learn your lesson. The second time they didn't learn their lesson, so penalty kills, and this is the crazy thing too, Scott, is they dominated in the face-off circle this game, something they struggled with all season long. They won 60% of their face-offs, but the two most crucial face-offs in the game on the penalty kill in the defensive zone, they could not win them in that cursed right circle where they don't have any right-handed centers. Baby. The cursed right circle. It, it just, 
it, it, crucial moments, man. And that's that's what sank them is not capitalizing on their chances and then these special teams moments. And Dylan Larkin said as much in the post game availability as those tweets are beginning to leak in, and I'm seeing them. Yeah, no, a- absolutely. I mean, like like we said, this was this was not a a very straightforward game. And like this isn't this isn't like excuses talk either. Like you lost and you lost big, and that's inexcusable. And you gotta you gotta figure out how to to convert on those opportunities. You know, it's it's not a not a consolation prize at all anymore. Like we're done with that part of the rebuild. But you know, th- this is a, a game where you look back afterwards and when you're talking about the positives as far as individual play goes you can name quite a few players there was a lot of players that looked really good in this one and uh, it, it those games are just weird when you get you know you get punched in the jaw you get blown out at home but yet afterwards you're like well this guy this guy this guy this guy and this guy all looked really good so like why, why are we here I mean, and that, I tweeted it out. I'm like, what's more frustrating, a blowout loss where the team just didn't look like they wanted to play or a blowout loss where you think they're the better of the two teams and they just couldn't right. get any luck yeah, from no. way? I mean, it was, sure. it was a super frustrating loss because you could see that the Red Wings – I felt like they deserved the win, but those two penalty kills, Heck of man. a game by Vanacek, too. Credit oh, credit dude, out of his mind. Unbelievable. On his I think head, for his sure. Expected, his goal saved above expected, I think, was like two and a half in this game. Yeah, dude. It, he, was, he was nutty. He had a couple of, like... And not the best game out of Huso, either. Not that I'm going to blame him for this no, loss 100%. Yeah. Of me, but anytime you give it five goals, it's not a great loss. Right. Yeah, we're the we're, we're, we're widely known as the, the goalie defenders. But uh, I'm okay I, I, I don't with that. Think, you're right. I, I, I mean, I'll do it again. <laughs> like I, you know, it, it definitely was not his, you know, an incredible performance by any stretch, but um, some of the, I mean, you know, the one where he made an incredible initial save and then just thought the puck was under his pad. And, yeah. You know, slid out out of the creek. Like, that one's but, not on him. I can't really blame the two power play goals on him because Dougie Hamilton wide on the point. Second one was a deflection. So it's, like I don't, I can't really blame. There's not an individual goal I can blame on. Who so? It was yeah, just, but like obviously you weren't there sharp for five. Than five either. Like whatever. yeah, it's it's one of those games. I, it was just one of those games where the Red Wings played really really well, and then nothing. It didn't go their way. Hockey and will hockey. That happens. hockey does that sometimes. New Jersey Devils are a really really good hockey team, and they can get out pl- there. Which is crazy that I'm saying this at this point in the hockey uh, hockey season because before the season I was just like I don't know what to expect out of the Devils. They could be really good. They could be garbage again. I don't know. Turns out they were yeah. really good and they're a really, really good hockey team and they're going to make the most out of their opportunities. And they did in this game. You did not That's something that the Red Wings are still learning how to do, but it doesn't mean they didn't play a good game. And I know we just, you just said like, we're past the point of moral victories. And in the end, I still want to finish uh, at 85 points and I want to be in the playoff conversation down the stretch and lose losses like this. Aren't going to help that. God dang it, if they didn't play really well, and I thought they deserved the win in this one. Like, just yeah. honest to God. And it starts with Robbie Fabry. Like, you could tell coming out of the gate how motivated this guy was. He wanted to, to get score. Back oh, he wanted it bad. And he was he, wa- he wanted to score so bad. He was swarming out there. He was yeah. everywhere on the ice, and he was playing so incredibly well. He was forcing turnovers, taking the puck away, making passes happen, shooting the puck, and he yeah, just cross checked a couple of times. Got cross checked a couple of couple Rasmussen cross checked by Tatar right out in front of the net on a yeah. scoring opportunity. Tatar, no call. Man. <laughs> of course. <laughs> I lo- I still have lots of love for Tatar. But no, me too. But, it should have been know, a penalty. Of course. Of course. There's a lot, a couple of missed calls. I just, Robbie Fabry, I thought, poured his heart out in this game. And I he deserved a goal. I think it, it would have been poetic if he had scored the first goal of the game. Didn't go that way. He'll have to wait another game, hopefully, for at least one more for his first goal in the season. But This uh, weekend. He, I thought he played really well. And it he did, man. He, to me. He, and, like, you can tell he... You could tell that he had been whatever, like practicing with the team. Like he, he definitely did not need a conditioning stint. Like he's like he 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 came out there buzzing. Yeah, it was clear that he was eager to get on the ice. And speed wise, I thought he looked great. That yeah, was no, my that, biggest exactly. concern. That that plays right into my point oh, too. He was yeah. skating really well. Third third ACL tear, first one on a different knee. Beauty. Didn't lose a step. He looked great. I was also so happy. just like who he that line was kind of fun. We should just talk about all the lines. That was a, we, that what we a lineup. What a what a lineup we, we threw we out there, to, man. I liked it. 
we got the negatives out of the way and we can focus on the positives because I thought that the, those forward lines, I thought Sider and Wolman were good again. I thought Philip Peronic playing with Ben Sherrod. I thought Philip Peronic especially had some great plays in this game defensively, yeah. which is an incredible statement in and, in and of itself. Um, but we'll, we'll get to all that in segment three. But first, I got to talk to you guys today about Built Bar. If you're looking for a delicious treat but don't want all of the fat and calories, then you got to try a Built Bar. We just got through the holidays, and I know my goal is to eat a little healthier this year, and that's actually my legitimate resolution. I want to lose a couple pounds. I think I gained about 10 last year. Wasn't hitting the gym as serious. Wasn't getting the Built Bars as I should have. If you're like me and you want to get healthier, but you don't want to compromise the taste, then man, you've got to try Built Bars. You've got to try them. With Built, healthy is actually tasty. Seriously, they're so delicious you won't think they're you won't think they're good for you. Perfect for the New Year's resolution, Scotty. We've tried the Built Bars before. We get them occasionally as samples. So when we talk to you about them, you know it's genuine, and it is genuine when we tell you that Built Bars are incredibly delicious. And I. The cookie dough chunk puff man. We had to read about that for a while, and I was hoping that one wouldn't go away because that one was legitimately my Bill favorite Bars. flavor of them all. I mean, yeah. actual cookie dough chunks and the built bar puff, which is a marshmallow protein bar, which is just like cheating in all honesty. Like that's just cheating. It was so good, and it's covered in 100 real chocolate. It was ridiculous. Too good to be true is an understatement. Yeah, and but it's not. They're, they they are real. They're authentic, and they're good for you. It is uh, crazy. Only 130 calories and four grams of sugar with a whopping 17 grams of protein. My protein shake only has 20, and those don't taste that good. Protein <laughs> bar, built bar, 17 grams, and they actually taste good and will fill you up. And now you don't need to wait around to get a box. For years, we've been talking about ordering your Built Bars at Built.com. Now you can get them at your local Walmart Walmart or Sam's Club. And that's news to me as I'm reading this, as there's a Walmart within oh, walking dude, distance yeah. of where I live. So that's actually huge. Pretty pumped about that. So it happened over the over the holidays, man. Yeah, what a deal. That's great. All right. Now we're, now we're really cooking. Uh, that's right. Head to your nearest Walmart today. Walk to the pharmacy section and grab yourself a box of Built Bars. You can pick up a four-bar box of cookies and cream, double chocolate, or coconut puffs. If you're close to a Sam's Club, run in and grab a 13-bar box with our hit flavors, brownie batter and churro. Got to try the churro. I can't only churro imagine. churro one is a heater, bro. Is it? It is. Oh, my goodness. It's so good. It's easily in my top three. So you can thank us later. Go to built.com, go to Walmart, go to Sam's Club, pick up some built bars. Segment two, segment three, rather. Sorry, getting getting ahead of myself, getting behind Third myself, and final. actually. Uh, segment three, Lockdown Red Wings podcast. Uh, we talked about Fabry. What, who else you want to focus on? I'll let you, let you go well, first. I, I mean, that's Pop the off. weird thing about this game. Like, so many people I thought actually looked pretty darn good. I've never um, been this happy after a loss. <laughs> yeah, like – it's hard to be like it's it's frustrating because of that, right? Like it's it, it's only frustrating because you feel like you should have won and you thought you were the better team for a majority of the night. It's not frustrating because necessarily it's it's in a vacuum a loss per se. So um, Fabry's obviously the, the the big one to start with. Um, I, I mean, I I feel like we say this every single night, but like Jonathan Bergeron is unreal, dude. Oh, dude, like, he's been so good. It's just. I guess that's. I guess we can just talk about the lines. The lines were weird, and I loved them. I loved the lines in this one, and that's why. Like, it's also super disheartening to get smacked because, like, I would kind of like to see some of these lines again and again. Uh, and I'm not sure how much patience they're gonna have for a uh, for a four goal loss with with these lines. Then not very much offense, uh, at least successful offense, producing offense on the night. So I don't know if we're going to see, um, we'll probably see more blender stuff happen, but, uh, I, I was really intrigued by the lines off rip and I continued to be throughout the game. And I, I thought Kubalik on line four was kind of sweet. And like, obviously we want him to, to get back to pre cool down, like if possible. Right. And when everybody wants him to be on the ice and, 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 you know, ripping clappers, but like, I, I don't know. I, I don't mind putting them with like some of the kids and be, like, Hey, if you need a shot, you got that on your line. You know what I mean? Like if you need a shot on that, because you, 
haven't had some offense in a while. You got you got a friend in me and Dominic Kubalik. Like, I I really liked the lines, man. I, I thought that that was like kind of a, a cool part of, of the game until it started going really south. No, that so that Joe Valeno, Dominic Kubalik, and Elmer Soderblom line is like my MVP line. I mean, yeah, the best line in the game was obviously line number one. Uh, Perron, Larkin, Rasmussen generated a lot of offense for the game, but I mean, underrated. MVP in this game. It's definitely Valeno, Kubelik, and Soderbaum. And man, Valeno, I didn't even recognize, they said it during the broadcast, I didn't realize he was on a six-game heater. I didn't realize he was on a six-game point streak coming yeah. in tonight. But because he's so, I feel like he's such an underrated player on this season. But they had a collective Corsi 4 percentage as a line of 73.68 and an expected goals 4 percentage of 73.79. And that was second best on the team of the Ford core out of all the Ford lines. And, you know, Elmer Soderblom individually was your best player at Corsi 4 percentage in this game. He had a 73.08 Corsi 4 percentage and had a expected goals 4 percentage, which was good for the third best on the team of 74.74, just behind David Perron and Dylan Larkin. So like Elmer Soderblom, who I've been repeatedly recorded as said, like is the one of the three I would consider to send back down. Cause I think he could use more polish. It's also consistently at the top of the line, uh, top of the stack card for, you know, quality shot attempts for and quality sh and shot attempts for, or ratio, at least he's just continued to impress night in and night out. And it's, it's almost sneaky the way he does it because it almost, you know, like Joe Valeno will be like, oh, wow, that was a nice move. Elmer Soderblom, while he has that in him, he's just in a lot of instances in the right spot, making Dude, the right plays. He has like the one thing that's so fun to watch with Elmer is just anytime he goes to the outside. Because he'll just put the stick out and just walk the dog right <laughs> along the boards and no one can poke it. It literally reminds me of like a cartoon where like a really tall dude is like puts his hand on the head of like a really short guy who's like trying to punch him and he can't reach him. <laughs> That's what it reminds me of. Anytime he goes along the boards and goes along the outside with the puck, man, he just but holds the stick out there, walks the dog a little bit, and no one can poke it away. And it is so entertaining to watch. And he did it like four times in this one. He's uh, really he's, good at protecting He's a unicorn, puck. man. I think if he lowers that center of gravity like half an inch, yeah, yeah. he'll be impossible to knock the puck off of. Um, I mean, yeah, so Dylan Larkin, David Perron, as per usual, Michael Rasmussen, as per usual, have really found a great chemistry on that top line. Which, I mean, coming into the season, I never would have suggested breaking up Bertuzzi, Raymond, and Larkin. And granted, injuries yeah. played a huge factor in the fact that that's broken up as Bertuzzi's a little less than a week away, probably right now. Larkin, Perron, and Rasmussen, and Rasmussen especially, continues to be, you know, low key another MVP. Is, I think, like the biggest thing, right? Because he mm -hmm. now they're putting him at wing, they're putting him at center if they need it for a night. Like the, the versatility and the ability for him to be productive and effective and mesh in with whatever line at whatever position is so vital to this team's depth. And, and I think that that's the reason why he is having such a successful season. I think the the reason for it is just like straight up, just figuring out how to use his size at the NHL level. And he's yeah, I, at, like I said, all three positions there in the forward group. You know what? And I think part of his success, and it's not a one-for-one -one comparison as they are slightly different players, but I think he fills that Tyler Bertuzzi hole. I mean, you look at what made the Raymond Larkin and Bertuzzi line so good right. last year is Bertuzzi was, in a lot of cases, a facilitator from the standpoint is he wasn't afraid to get into the corners, get in front of the net, cause chaos, throw bodies around, dig the puck out, and then give the puck to Dylan Larkin and Lucas Raymond and then go to the net. Michael Rasmussen fills that niche that that Perron and Larkin need, uh, that Larkin and Perron needed. Now Rasmussen is a bigger body with not as good hand as hand, not as good of hands as Bertuzzi, but he does fill that niche in a very similar manner. Yeah. And I think that's why it's been working so good. And don't get me wrong. Perron can throw his weight around too. He's been known to th throw a couple of hits, but he's much more of a finisher. Dylan Larkin is a playmaker and a finisher. Michael Rasmussen is a net front presence and a physical player. So I think that that just complements that line really well. And I think, again, the, the ability of him to play as, as center to and take those draws just adds to his versatility, like you said. Yeah, 100%. Um, I'm trying to think of 
defense. I mean, a cider I thought looks pretty good. Oh, I mean that Wallman, like the cider and Wallman pairing. Wallman I thought looked really good. Yes, there. What I noticed is specifically about a hundred mile an hour shot, ninety nine miles an hour. Don't don't embellish. Don't embellish. Don't embellish. All right, I won't <laughs> embellish the Red Wings. Never mind. <laughs> um, you're not the you're not the New Jersey Devils. You don't embellish. Come on now. All um, right. Ayo. Not as slick as you wanted to be. I don't think. I just I dunk on him. Uh, <laughs> don't ever do that again. <laughs> um, but anyways, no. The one thing I noticed specifically about the Woolman and Cider pair is their ability to cycle position positionally. Yeah. Um, Woolman at one point, man, it's, it's oh yeah, nuts. The the way they offensively mesh on the blue line. One moment I'm talking about in particular is Woolman pit, stepped up and pinched in. And then Cider immediately slid over. And then when Wallman off the pinch went over to Cider's side, there's that seamless cycle. There doesn't seem to be like, really? I mean, obviously communication is key, but it's like nonverbal. They just know. And then in the defensive zone, their ability to cover for one another, that pair has played really well early in this um, two games into their pairing. And it's reflected in their statistics. I mean, both Moritz Sider and Jake Wollman were over 60% expected goals for percentage in this game and over 60% at Corsi for percentage in this game. And granted, in this game, a lot of Red Wings were at even strength, but that doesn't take yeah. away from the fact that Sider and Wollman were a big contributing factor to that. I thought they played incredibly well. And I thought Philip Ronick played really well in this game as well. He was paired with Ben Chirot. And I thought there were a couple times where Ben Chirot maybe... There, there was one instance in particular. I won't say Ben Chirot had a bad game because, honestly, I just wasn't watching Ben Chirot that much in this game. I was watching a lot more Philip Ronick. But Ben Chirot got the pass on the blue line, went to back up, coughed the puck up, and it ended up being a two-on-two -two coming back as Ben Chirot backed out of the zone. They tried to make a move on Philip Pronick at the blue line who straight up just stayed with this guy and denied the zone entry. And he denied two or three zone entries. Defensively, he got behind the net, played the body, stripped the puck, and then in front of the net, he broke up passes and blocked shots. Phil Peronic had an extraordinary defensive game. Yeah. And it just it just continues to snowball for him as he's having a career year on both ends of the ice. Yeah, he's I mean, what can you really say about him, man? He's he's about unreal. And yeah, I, I think since like I don't know, December, December one, probably, just around like post thanks American Thanksgiving, he has been just very clearly improved defensively. I feel like at the beginning of the year, we were like, oh yeah, you know, like him and Mata work so well because he's so great offensively and Mata's so great defensively. And like, and, and, and that's still, I still think that pairing is exceptional for a ton of reasons. And that's probably still one of them, but it, it really throughout the season, he has become more and more, uh, I don't want to say developed on the defensive end because I don't think that even really does it justice. He, he's just taken huge strides defensively. And and I, if we haven't made that clear enough, I think he definitely deserves his flowers in that regard because it's been like that for the last month or so. He's been kind of night and day difference defensively than we're used to. He's been earning those flowers. I mean, look at the – he's increased responsibility minutes-wise and lineup depth-wise. Yeah, wise. He's and like deservedly to the so, top obviously. Pair. Yeah, he's been, I mean, the most productive defender on the team. Not necessarily yeah. best, not most talented, but the most productive, I mean, comfortably. Yeah. Uh, the last thing I want to get to is I want to look at the heat map because I think it tells the Bring tale of the game. Locked on Red Wings heat maps, man. Well, here you go. Um, this is in all situations, so this includes the power play goals, the penalty kill goals, Jeez. whatever you want to call it. The th let's look at the Red Wings first because there's a lot of good happening here. Yeah. Um, even at even strength, this heat map looks almost identical because Red Wings didn't generate a lot of offense on their own power play. Obviously, they scored their one goal in the power play, but it was off the rush. Um, Wings got Lucas even higher in the slot there, which is nice. Mm -hmm. Well, that's the thing that Prashanth Iyer pointed out early in the f first period is that they clearly have a plan, and that was to attack the middle of the ice, and they did that. Look, the 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 fact that their heat map is that big says that they were able to get to the slot and get opportunities. They just could not bury it on Venacek. And I thought the I thought the Devils did a really good job of clogging up the middle too to really make that those op make sure those opportunities weren't great opportunities, but. The Red Wings clearly had a game plan here and executed well. They just couldn't find the back of the net. The Devils, on the other hand, the Red Wings still struggle keeping teams out of their inner dot, out of their inner slot, because you never want that much dark blue 
right in front of your right. goal. And all five of their goals came from up the middle, like just yeah. dead center up the middle. They were doing the opposite of what the Devils were doing, which was clogging the middle. The Red Wings had a lot of opportunities up the middle, but the Devils did a great job of making sure those opportunities weren't prime time. Devils had a lot of prime time opportunities, and that's why they scored five goals on you. 100%. Yeah, I don't have anything else to say. You're absolutely right. So, yeah, that's a that's about it, man. I do you have anything else you want to talk about? Anything else you want to mention? Um, I don't think so. I think that's everybody individually that I, I want to talk about. I mean, yeah, just a weird game, man. Just a weird weird game. You know, and, and upset because we 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 I thought we played better for a majority of the game and and should have been in a it should have been a much closer game at least. Nonetheless, uh uh, potentially a victory so that part's obviously frustrating but uh, a, a lot of good to take from this game I, I don't think this is a, a doom and gloom you know blowout loss like most of them usually are absolutely uh Raymond got the power play gold make it five to one break the shutout yeah uh, seven points in seven games assisted by Larkin and Cider great play great break out of the rush started by Cider that's it we'll talk to you guys tomorrow we got two game previews to do Yes, sir. Any final thoughts? We ball. We ball. All right. Same time, same place, your team every, every day. day. But online.